Hi, welcome to Rockdown. I'm Wendy Stapleton, and you may think that I've got a new set. It's good, isn't it? It's beautiful. Very good. It's a beautiful set. No, we're in sunny uh, South Melbourne, and I have the pleasure of interviewing the one and only Mr. Jeff Duff, who I haven't seen for a long, long time. How are you, Jeff? Um, I'm fantastic. All the better for seeing you. Look at you. My pajamas, actually. I just woke <laughs> You're up. You're gorgeous. This is how I go to bed. You're in Melbourne doing some shows. I am. I'm I've, a reformation of my old seventies band from Melbourne, Kush. We uh, we did a show on Saturday at the Toff in the city, and it was huge. How is that? I haven't been there yet. Is it a great venue? It was fantastic. It's like a, a little vaudeville stage, and uh, it was packed out with um, you know lots of Cushow files. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was fantastic. I um, I went through my my uh, normal uh, half a dozen costume changes. And I uh, ended up in a leotard. <laughs> and um, As only you could do. Yeah, I do. I, I think I'm probably one of the few, uh, you know, people from the 70s that could still get into a leotard and, you know, look comfortable. Well, you've kept yourself looking pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Let's, start, let's start at the beginning because I was asking you before that you are a Melbourne boy originally. I am. Where were you from? Uh, from Canterbury, you know, um, and my father actually told me um, a couple of weeks ago, he said that the property that we lived in in Logan Street in Canterbury has just gone for 1.5 million. And, you know, when we lived in it, it would have been 1.500, I think. <laughs> so when you were a kid, I'm with still this a kid. voice, I know, we're all still kids, um, this huge voice, uh, did someone else in the family sing? Did your dad sing? Did your mum sing? Where uh, did it come from? No, they didn't really sing. Although mum used to, I, I, I took singing lessons. Actually, I took singing lessons from a, a lady called Voila Rich who used to teach John Farnham. You Me too? too. Right. Oh, right. That's who I learned from. Right. Well, I think From Jack Wyatt. Yeah, yeah. I think everybody this went there. Everyone went there. In the day. I don't you know. You know what was fabulous? I, I say these days, you know, th this is very politically incorrect to smoke anywhere now. Yeah, yeah. But Voila Ritchie, and I saw Voila a few years ago, and I hope she's still with us, used to sit... At the piano with a fag. Yeah, yeah. Hanging out of her mouth and playing your song, and she's saying, and breathe! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Breathe! Yeah. And she had this fag. Wasn't it great? I know. And also, you know, because I, I have problems sleeping still today. I, I still can't sleep. And she used to say, because she's a bit of a drinker, she used to say, have a, have, a, have a glass of red wine before you go to bed. That'll knock you out. And she said, if that doesn't work, drink the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Was Kush the first band? No, I was, because uh, I went to, um, at, in Canterbury State School, I, I went there and I, I started uh, learning, well actually I made my own kit of drums and I won this art competition and uh, the, the, the first prize was to appear on television and do whatever you can with your, your, uh, your creation. So I started playing my drums, which was made out of saucepans and cardboard and stuff. And then I thought, oh, gee, I, I should learn how to play drums. So I, I had uh, drum lessons and I, I had a little band when I was 12, I think little instrumental band playing drums. And then I wanted to sing. I thought, oh, gee, I'm not getting any chicks way back here on the drums. So I um, I started singing and I was in a few bands. I went to Box Hill Tech and I was in a couple of bands there. Did, did the situation change rapidly when she started singing? No, I started... Did you pull? A, yeah, but guys. <laughs> so. But you're straight. Yeah, I'm straight. But they didn't know that. You know, They okay. thought any guy in a dress you know, is bound to be... Um, I started making my own clothes. And leotards were really easy to make. I just get a T-shirt and just tie it in at the crutch and put a zip down the front, and you know, and and that was easy. And it was pretty hot, so uh, it was easy to make leotards. And it was also easy to buy wedding dr ex <laughs> wedding dresses at, at op shops. And I didn't really, you know, I didn't really look at it as being a little strange or queer or gay or no, anything. No, you were artistic. That was just the way I was. Well, Bowie did it. Yeah. And I, I started wearing makeup as well. And, you know, I wear makeup just about every day. And I don't, I don't even know. I don't even question why I do it. It's just something I've always done. It doesn't seem to me as being unusual or different. It's just, just the way I am. When people ask me, why, did you, why do you dress like that? Or why did you dress like that? I say, dress like what? That's just the way I am. You know, it's just like putting on your shoes. That's just the, what I did and what I do now. So it doesn't strike me as being un, unusual. We're going to take a short break. And after that, I'm going to ask you about England because we were over there at the same time. Yeah. And uh, Duffo on the social circuit over there, especially around Kensington in yeah. London, was a very, very well-known persona. Yeah, he was hot property there for a day. Okay, we'll take a short <laughs> break. Be back soon.
Rock down. Here we are back on Rock Down with the wonderful, amazing Jeff Duff. <laughs> and we are looking at yourself, Paul McCartney. He's from Boomtown Rats. The, his, his name is Johnny Fingers. He was the, the keyboard player keyboard in player. Bob Geldof's band. All right, so just to fill you in on what's happened during the break, after Kush, um, you went to London. I went to London, yeah. I was, I was. Well, actually, just prior to go, I had to earn some money to go over to London, so I formed this uh, little band called the Jeff Duff Survival Band, and I had the guys from Little River Band. I had David Briggs and George McArdle from Little River Band, and it was just a little trio, and we travelled... Perth and Brisbane and Adelaide, I think, uh, just to, in order to make some money. And the guy from Australia was in charge of Virgin Records in London. And he came back, and my manager at the time, Ray Hearn, uh, got together with him. And, and this guy from Virgin bought back all these punk records and, and a lot of the Virgin catalogue, you know, which consisted of Sex Pistols, etc. And, uh, and, and also some clothes, you know, and I'm a real clothes junkie. And, and this guy, Laurie Dunn, he said, oh, he came to a couple of my gigs and he said, wow, you'd, you'd really enjoy London. And I started listening to this music and I thought, wow, I really have to get over there. I love this. It was so anti what I'd been brought up on. Like the Kush thing was so musical and I was always, you know, taught via Viola to sing correctly. All of a sudden there was this stuff that wasn't really musical and they weren't really singing. They were screaming and yelling and, and it was really um, completely the opposite of what I'd been taught. But there was something about it that excited me so much. And I thought, I have to be in London. I have to go over for this punk thing. Um, you yeah. were absolutely famous because um, now we'll just look quickly. Let's have, have a look through this and we'll, we'll show everybody. You know, we'd have we'd have parties, and I, I, I'd have to be at the parties with all these people. You know, like and, and you know Bill Wyman, Bill and, Wyman, and Britt Eklund. Oh, and, you know, apparently we had an affair in in London at the, at the time. But you know, through my publicist, we you know you just hook up with all these people. And Andy Warhol, Andy Warhol became a friend of mine, and this is me autographing my record for him. Everyone in London just knew you, Duffo. They just knew you. Yeah. So how did you, was this like from your outrageous publicity? Sort of I think so. Or? I mean, you know, like I'm, I'm a pretty mild-mannered guy, really. But um, I think I was more notorious than famous. I think, you know, I, got, I did get into a lot of trouble. I had no idea how to, how to handle all the media I was getting, all the press. It was ridiculous. But it was all... Um, it's probably not not the best press. I mean, you know, like the record company said to me, um, you know, normally when we sign we, we sign an act, we get them to do something really strange on the signing. You know, the Sex Pistols have just trashed Buckingham Palace. Why don't you go to the? We'll ta we'll drive you to the front of the Prime Minister's house in uh, Downing Street and, you know, take your clothes off or something. So I did, but I had a body stocking underneath, so I wasn't naked. But I did get arrested um, for insulting behaviour, and, and I was taken to court. Uh, and charged with insulting behaviour, I think it was. What did you get for that? Uh, I think uh, $60, uh, 60 pounds, I mean. Well, I didn't pay, the record company paid because they got great photographs of it. In fact, one of the photographs won photographic highlights of uh, 1978 in, uh, in the Music Weekly, I think it was, yeah. So, I mean, it was good, but, you know, like it wasn't really good. It didn't really give me much musical credibility. I mean, I was still foremost a singer and, you know, I, you know, I was doing all this ridiculous, bizarre press stuff. But you stayed there for a long time. I stayed there for 10 years and I made half a dozen albums. And, you know, ironically, uh, starting as, as a sort of a, a pseudo punk, I suppose, as Duffo, I ended up working with um, Peter Green from Fleetwood Mac, um, the guys from Ultravox recorded with me, um, guys from Roxy Music played with me and Frankie Goes to Hollywood keyboard player became my keyboard player. I worked with these incredible musicians. So, uh, you know, maybe I didn't, uh, even though I had, like when I arrived, my first single was called Give Me Back Me Brain, you know, which is uh, ridiculous really. And that became a bit of a hit. So, I mean, I was supposedly meant to be insane anyway. So I just, you know. I, you I, went with it. Yeah, I became typecast and, you know, like, dressing up in cling film and, you know, strange makeup. That was just part of the deal. Mind you, as Duffo, I, I'd sort of um, engulfed this whole Duffo character and I actually lived the whole Duffo character. So it was really my fault. I'm not blaming the publicist. I mean, the publicist was amazing. You know, I mean, the, you know, they just did incredible. They invented stories and uh, they created stories and... Um, the media would always buy them, you know, so it didn't really matter. I didn't really care that my, you know, that they were the wrong moves. I was just, you know, because I was new in the country. I didn't know. I thought everybody did what I did. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, no. No, no, they didn't. Oh, no. So do you think that because of the Duffo persona, consequently, a lot of the time your music was overlooked? Definitely. I mean, I did some great... The, the la- I did three I did a, a, a three albums together with this a musician's label called PVK Records, which had Peter Green from Fleetwood Mac. That's why I worked with him. And these other musicians... Uh, another guitarist from Rolling Stones was on this label. So it was just a musician's label. And they signed me, and I did three albums with them, they 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 employed orchestras and stuff and and they're all my songs we um and and it was uh, you know I was throwing all this these incredible musicians with great studios and stuff and those albums are, today are still some of the best albums that I've recorded but they because of my credit you know, not my credibility I had credibility but I mean people cast me aside as a bit of a you know a bit of a character one of the reasons I came back was I wanted to form my own little orchestra you know like a, a really um out there orchestra playing my original music and um that would i started doing it in london but it became really you know as you know it's very very difficult it's hard doesn't it yeah because you like this if you haven't got money if you haven't got a lot of money england's not a lot of fun is it no and if you signed to a record company i mean my record companies in london supported me though you know they used to mother me i mean no they were really fantastic beggars banquet and cherry red i signed to cherry red and to pvk records they all looked after me incredibly well like you know, like I was like an adopted orphan, if you like, you know, because you know th- they could see that I, I you know, I was a hundred percent into my music, and uh, they always said I worked harder than any English person they ever signed. What we'll do is we'll take another short break. I'm going to have a look at your photo album, and when we come back, uh, let's we'll, talk about what you're doing now. Yeah, we'll line up the bong and we'll get into it. Ooh, okay. Rock down. Welcome back to Rockdown. My special guest is Jeff Duff. Now, this is how I remember you mm-hmm. from the Kush days. No eyebrows. <laughs> my eyebrows have fallen off. I used to shave every part of my body. I think I, I was a Brazilian before Brazilian. This. Tell us about this. Well, as I mentioned before, Kush uh, did uh, three... I think we did all the Sunbreeze. We supported Deep Purple. And, um, yeah, I made a costume out of Christmas balls. <laughs> And, with uh, a key? With a, a revolving key on my back and a revolving key on my head. I really was into, you know, fresh out of art school, I was really into creating my own costumes. And like 35 years later, uh, the guys from Deep Purple asked me to sing on uh, a new record that uh, they had a splinter group called um, The Hoochie Coochie Men, and I, I became the singer with Ian Gillen, the, the singer from uh, Deep Purple. Was that la- did you say last that? year? Last year, yeah. Fantastic. That's so that's on their new album. That's yeah, but it's called the Hoochie Coochie Men, featuring John Lord, you know, the keyboard player from Deep Purple, yeah, yeah. and Ian Gillen, and actually Jimmy Barnes sings a couple of songs on it too. So uh, fantastic, full circle. Yeah, full circle. And this is well, Frankie goes to Hollywood, just happening, and I, I like the music, but I thought it was funny, so I uh, I created this character called Cyril Trotz to Bogner, who is a complete parody of Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And I recorded an album. I, this re- this record label called Cherry Red really liked my my album. And I re- I also wrote a book about the whole thing called Cyril Trotz in Reverse. It was about him dying and then going back a bit like that new movie with um, Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. But you know I did it thirty years before. I've watched it. I've seen you on telly. Right. On Kerry shows and and every time I've seen you, it's been a different sort of idea. So yeah. You really are. So innovative. Well, I don't or versatile, but I don't think it is even versatile. It's just what I do. Yeah, you know, I mean, I would get so bored if I had to sing one style of music or one particular area, genre of music. So I, I've I've covered just about all the bases, but not because I've deliberately tried to do, you know, the orchestra or the punk band or the big band or the Bowie band or the funk band. It's just what I do, you know, I've, I've, I've grown up listening to all that music. I grew up, grew up listening to Blood, Sweat and Tears, Sly and the Family Stone, Frank Sinatra, David Bowie, whatever. So I just, uh, I do all that stuff. And, and, you know, now as I said, I've been asked to come to Melbourne and do this Ray Charles yes, show. Yes, tell us about that. Well, um, uh, Craig Wilkins, who, who'd written this show, he used to write all these television dramas like the uh, the Waltons. Is it the Waltons? No, what's the Australian one? Ah, uh, the Sullivans. The Sullivans. He was writing for that, and he's written a few other television shows. And he, he's heard me. He's followed my career, and he said, "Would you be interested in doing this Ray Charles show? It's going to be in churches with the gospel choir, and there's a there's a couple of black guys doing it." And I said, "Are you sure you got the right guy? I mean, I'm, I'm a skinny white dude, you know." Is this 
Sorry, is this a television show? No, it's going to be a live, a live show. show. And, and apparently it's going to start in September and um, it's it's at the Baptist Church in Collins Street in Melbourne. What a fantastic idea. Yeah, and it's 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 called uh, Genius, you know, the story of Ray Charles. And we have to sing about 30 songs. I, I sing, you know, half of them, I guess. But, you know, and there's no... There's no um, mention of me putting on blackface like Al Jolson. I just have to be me and uh, and sing the songs. So you're doing a movie or you've done a movie. Yeah. And also, I have to tell you, uh, the people that did that movie are interested in making a movie of my life because I've written a book called The Naked Singer. And I sent the uh, I sent the book, well, t- I sent a few chapters to uh, the, the producer and director and they really loved it. And they said, wow, this will make a great movie. And I said, yeah, yeah, it would too. Uh, the movie is called Sons of Steel, and it's a heavy metal science fiction musical comedy. And I played this um, um, uh, nutty professor, I suppose, or scientist. You know, I'm paranoid schizoid. I, I end up in drag and, uh, you know, I, I turn people into holograms and send them into the future. Is it out yet? Yeah, it's Is out. It released? Yeah, yeah, it's been out a while. Oh, we can see it. And I just the the director just sent me a director's cut of it, and it's uh, it's yeah, yeah, it's pretty weird though. It's called again. Sons of Steel. You know what? This has been the most interesting interview I've done. I've got to tell you, um, you've just got to see it to believe it. You'll get to look at all these photos, Jeff. You're always busy. You're not down in Melbourne near enough, so it'll be great when you get down here in September. Timber? Yeah, but I mean that's going to be a very straight role for me. I just have to sing. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Well, at least we get to see you. So uh, we're going to take you out with a clip from the movie. Is that correct? I think so. Yeah, it's pretty strange. I mean, uh, but you know, strange is part of my thing, I guess. Would you please thank Jeff Duff? Hallelujah. To learn. <laughs> Yes, I stay down here to live and to learn while they stayed outside and burn. <laughs> Faith is <Yeah>. Faith! Faith! <laughs> Faith! <laughs> Don't give up yet.